Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. The show you're about to hear is part of a series of shows recorded in San Francisco at the Artificial Intelligence Conference, which was hosted by our friends at O'Reilly and Intel Nirvana. In addition to their support for the event itself, Intel Nirvana is also our sponsor for this series of podcasts from the event. A huge thanks to them for their continued support of this show. Make sure you check out my interview with Naveen Rao, VP and GM of Intel's AI Products Group, and Scott Appland, Director of Intel's Developer Network, which you can find at twimlai.com slash talk slash 51. At the AI conference, Intel Nirvana announced DevCloud a cloud-hosted hardware and software platform for learning, sandboxing, and accelerating the development of AI solutions. The DevCloud will be available to 200,000 developers, researchers, academics, and startups via the Intel Nirvana AI Academy this month. For more information on the DevCloud or the AI Academy, visit intelnirvana.com slash devcloud for machine intelligence. In our talk, we take a super deep dive on the mathematical underpinnings of TDA and its practical application in software. Nerd alert. All right, on to the show. Hey everyone, I am here at the O'Reilly and Intel Nirvana AI conference, and I've got the pleasure to be seated here with Gunnar Carlson, who is the president of IASD. Welcome, Gunnar. Thank you. Great to be here. Absolutely. Great to have you. So why don't we start with having you tell us a little bit about your background and your areas of research? Mm -hmm. So I I come from an academic background. I did my PhD in mathematics and for the first 20, 25 years of my career worked very much in pure mathematics. Okay. Over time, I started to become more interested in how could we apply things that we were doing in the pure math side on a shorter time frame because oftentimes the applications have a very long, you know, long time to go. Yeah. And so we want to try to do some things more quickly. And my main area within mathematics is topology, which is the study of shape. In the generalized sense, one can talk about shapes in higher dimensions. And so I wanted to apply that to the study of large and complex data. It turned out it led to a lot of things, basically a big career change. It wasn't just a little hobby thing. You know, we found that it was a very hot topic, both for the National Science Foundation and DARPA, the, the research arm or the innovation arm within, within DOD. In the middle of that, we spun out a company, uh, Ayazdi Incorporated, which is so commercializing the ideas coming out of there and, and other things as well. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, I live in the Stanford campus. I'm a math professor at Stanford, or retired math professor at Stanford, okay. I should say. And there I've got the, you know, three grown kids who are in the area and so yeah. Awesome. Sound yeah. like a busy guy. Busy guy, but it's a lot of fun. I don't want to not be busy. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about topological data analysis and topology in general, mm-hmm. which was the topic of a tutorial that you did here at the conference today. Yeah. You mentioned the study of shapes. The first mm-hmm. thing that comes to my mind is like high school geometry and trigonometry. But I imagine it gets a lot more interesting when you're talking about higher dimensions and lots of data. It is. On the other hand, sometimes what you can do is get very simple you know, small representations of complex data sets by the things, the simple things that, that, that you mentioned. Okay. So what we do is we represent data by network models. So when you think about mathematical modeling, one often thinks about algebra, one thinks about equations, right. one thinks about, you know, various kinds of equations and so forth. But maybe one should try to model data by something else, maybe something with a richer output than just equations. And for okay. us, the output of our models is a uh, network in the computer science sense that is nodes and edges. Okay. And it turns out to be a very useful compressed representations of data sets for many different uh, applications. Okay, interesting. Now, when you say network and nodes and edges, I think of graphs. Mm-hmm. Is, is this graph theory we're talking about? It, well, they are, one can view it in that way. But, you know, a lot of times graph theory deals with very nitty-gritty local discussions of degree and so forth. Right. You know, this is sometimes thinking of it as a higher dimensional shape. So, 
For example, you know, a graph with four nodes and uh, might actually encode a tetrahedron rather than just its edges. And so okay. we kind of think in those terms. So yeah, it is, it is graph theory in some sense, in the sense that we study graphs. I would say that we do it in a way that's different from what is usually meant by graph theory in the math side. It's more what's meant by shape and topology on the topology side of math, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And so how does this all play into machine learning? One of the big things about machine learning is that it's great, but many people, including people like regulators, like MDs, you know, all the people that one might want to use it with, often regard it as a black box. They regard it as something which, you know, although it seems to produce good answers, they can't put their head around, understand where it came from. And that means that sometimes there's, there's some difficulty in, you know, making use of it for those reasons. Mm -hmm. And so we view ourselves, we view the topological data analysis as, you know, a part of the growing area of machine learning. You know, we believe that it, it produces richer models than just simply classifiers or linear regression models that might come out or clustering that comes out of machine learning. And so, you know, it's just an, it, it's, it's augmenting and helping machine learning develop over time. That's how we view it. Okay. So I heard a couple of things in there. I heard one that the models are richer and I'd like you to explain or elaborate on, on why that is. But I also heard the, you suggest that this approach, the taking things from a topological perspective, aids in explainability. That's and that's a, you know, a huge issue for you know, the, the constituencies that you mentioned, the that's regulators, right. but also you know, a, a business that's going to depend on you yeah. know, machine learning or artificial intelligence, whatever we want to call it. Exactly. You know, they, they want more than just the box set it, mm -hmm. right? You know, kind of walk us through you know, the next level of what TDA is all about mm -hmm. and how it lends itself to achieving those goals for machine learning. So let me talk about an example, you know, for the explainability part for okay. the machine learning. So, and, and, and let me say, by the way, so what we produce, we produce a network. It's, it can be viewed as a map of your data in a sense. And so, okay. you know, for us, we were working with a bank that had failed the stress testing, CCAR stress testing process mm -hmm. two years in a row. They had failed it in part, uh, most part, because they had produced machine learning models, which, you know, were reasonably, which were predictive, but which were not understandable. That is to say, they came as a large vector of numbers, vector of coefficients, if you like, and the regulators couldn't understand. So the, the stress testing process is the bank basically has to say, I've got this much reserves based on my risk, and I've got to justify that some kind of way. And they produced this model, but they couldn't explain what the model was doing. That's to right. It wasn't it. explainable enough. For, yeah. for yeah, that, That's correct. And so for us, you now the model was actually based on a lot of features, a lot of macroeconomic and, and other kind of global economic indicators. Okay. And so we built one of our models on that. And within that model, we found several hotspots for a correlation with revenue in a business unit. And, mm -hmm. But more than one. And so for each one of those, we might adjoin one or two features from each of those hotspots, those groups. And let me say, and so the hotspot itself turns out to be a large collection of, you know, of these economic indicators, but they were understandable to the regulators. Mm -hmm. So we tell them, look, we have a model with four features. Okay, first of all, much smaller. And then each feature is representative of you know, some class of features which are recognizable as similar or related by regulators. Mm -hmm. And that is what we would call, you know, an understandable model, a small, okay. low dimensional and annotation in terms of a group for each one of the features. Okay. I've got some questions. So you started out by saying you built, you were talking about their model and you said you built a model on, on that. Did you build your model on their model or no, on no, their? Sorry, no, no. We're building separate models. We're on building, their data. Building, you know, very yes, on their data, right. but not on their model. Got That's it. right. We're building, you know, there we involved many hundreds or even thousands of variables. You know, ours was is, is is a small number of variables, and each one is understood as being representative of a class of indicators, all of which have right. strong correlation. Yeah, it almost sounds like what you're doing is you're like semantically clustering the features That's and correct. kind of ranking the features in their relevance to the prediction. That's correct. But here's the interesting feature in this. You might say, well, 
why don't you just take all the features and find the ones that are the most correlated? Right. You know, why do you need a model? Well, the reason is that features are perhaps correlated with revenue for different reasons. And so you have different groups of things which are correlated in different ways. If you put them all together, you know, you don't get nearly the same kind of explainability as you do when you have them separate them out and understand that, you know, each one is representative of a particular class of things that are similar. So that, that's the key thing there. Mm -hmm. So I get the example, and I kind of get what you're yeah. doing, but still, how do you explain the TDA part of that? Like, like mm -hmm. to a, at the next level of detail, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. what how are do you explain, doing, what, what or do you how does it work? Oh, yeah. let me, so let me, let me tell you, and again, this may get a little geeky, but let's uh, go ahead and hey, try we, it anyway. I, we love geeky. We love geeky. <laughs> All right. So, you know, the, the starting point for us is always a data set equipped with a similarity measure of some kind. Okay. So we encode that as actually a distance function in a mathematical sense, which is an abstraction of ordinary distance that we have, you know, in the plane or in space. Mm -hmm. And is this, is your distance function something that might be like your, your error function or is it distance of the, you know, your rows or your points within the data set itself? It's that, it's distance of one row to another. Um, okay. Yeah. And so, so, you know, a normal thing is supposing that it were that we, we really only had two coordinates, you know, two or two features. Then my rows would be two vectors, uh, you know, with two entries, and I could compute their distance regarding them as being in the plane. Mm -hmm. And that distance would be that would be a perfectly good distance that we could work with. Right. Now, the thing is that oftentimes for, you know, for different phenomena with more features. It, well, by the way, those formulas for distance in dimension two, they extend to any number of dimensions. So if I have a spreadsheet with numbers, you know, it doesn't matter whether I've got you know, five or 10 or even a thousand fields, it's all good. You can go ahead and compute with it. Yeah. But supposing that you're in a situation instead, you know, like you are in, in, in the study of genetics, where you have long sequences in an alphabet of symbols. Mm -hmm. you know, you might, what you might do is you might take the two sequences and say, well, how many spots do they differ in? And keep account of that. And that is a distance or similarity measure as mm -hmm. well. That's one that we want to use in that context. So, in fact, you know, for us, there are sort of many different choices of these distance functions. There's libraries of them and so on. But, you know, I've just given you kind of two important ones. The first one would be called Euclidean or generalized Euclidean. The second one would be called Hamming. So it's called correlation, angle, and cosine, mm -hmm. and so on. So there's a lot of variety of them. But the idea is always to get at some notion of similarity of data points. So where if the distance is small, we regard the data points as similar, and if they're far apart, we regard them as dissimilar. So maybe let's take this back to your example with the bank. You know, given a data set that consists of macroeconomic factors and transactions perhaps and portfolios and the like, mm -hmm. like what does a distance mean in well, that context? Well, so all those things though are, there are numbers they're hard. So this is really just a spreadsheet. So I could do the Euclidean distance there. I think there's a variant on Euclidean distance, which is called you know, variance normalized Euclidean, which means that if you've got some variables that have much larger range than others, you might want to make those ranges the same so that the one variable doesn't swamp the others. But fundamentally, it would be the first one that I talked about. You know, it would be a notion of yeah. Euclidean. Yeah. But I guess maybe the question that I'm asking is, does a Euclidean distance or any distance, I guess, in the general case, have a, like a semantic meaning in a highly high dimensional data set? Or is it just the distance between points in the data uh, you, set? You, you know, I think it, it does, it's, not, it's not that one justifies it in terms of semantics or okay. theory, but what one observes is that you know, it does typically coincide with one's notion of similarity. If it does not, then you know maybe this is a data set for which some other metric is mm -hmm. or distance is is more usable. Okay. Again, it's more what you actually see in the data. It's not about the theory that says, oh yes, you know this is the this is the one you want to use. Okay, got it. So you you define this distance mm -hmm. metric and apply it to the data, and then what? And then what? So now what we want to do is, well, we have a projection of the data set. Mm -hmm. Which, and I won't go into detail on that, but basically what we do is we find, we bin the data set into overlapping bins. Mm -hmm. We do that in a systematic way, and it has to do with a projection of some kind. Mm -hmm. And once that's done, we perform a clustering step within each of those bins. Mm -hmm. Each cluster is now made the node of a network, 
Mm -hmm. and we connect two nodes if they share a data point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a short version of it. But it's a kind of what we would call partial clustering. That's to say okay. we don't apply clustering to the whole data set. We apply it to a bunch of pieces, and those produce points for a network or nodes for a network. Okay. Make sense? It does. It almost, it makes me think of a number of things, things like word embeddings. It makes me think of things like, I don't even know what, I don't remember the general terminology for it, but there's a company called Cortical or Numenta, like they, they do something similar to word embeddings. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of evokes that for me, but it also evokes for me like a convolutional neural net where you're like mm -hmm. windowing your bins or kind of like your convolution windows that you're moving across your image. It is a little bit. I, I think there actually, I think there are a lot of connections with that. We're just starting to develop those now. So, I, okay. you know, it's a slightly different. It goes through a part of this whole TDA business, which we haven't talked about, and, yeah. which is about measuring shape through what's called persistent homology. Okay. And, you know, that's it, this is a very kind of, it's always been regarded as the most esoteric part of mathematics for, for, for reasons that are they're kind of quite necessary to it, but nevertheless, it's very powerful. It allows you to measure shape. It allows you to say, look, is there a loop in your data? Is there a sphere in your data? You know, are there connected components here? All those kind of things that we think about, it allows you to actually measure those in a formal way. Mm -hmm. So this, this last step you described, you're taking your, your bins, and I, I heard yeah. that is a windowing kind of effect in it the is data. Kind of, it's key that the bins be overlapping mm -hmm. in this case, that not that they be disjoint. It's key that they be overlapping okay. because we want the clusters to have the ability to overlap so we can draw edges between them. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then tell me where you, what you do with your distance metric once you have these bins. Actually, now we, we, that's how we use that. We only use the distance metric so as to be able to get the bins. Okay. And perform clustering within the bins. Got it. Once I've performed clustering within the bins, you know, at this point, I can, for the time being, shelve the, the metric okay. and say, look, the representation I'm interested in, which can be thought of as a generalized Venn diagram, if you yeah. like, you know, is this network model. And this network model is something that we now want to examine. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about that mm -hmm. examination process. That right. sounds like that's what's next. That's right. So, so let me say, by the way, first of all, that the, I'm gonna, what I'm going to describe is sort of the way to sort of interact with the model, you know, visually and on the screen and so on. But mm -hmm. one can also interact with it programmatically. And that's what, what one wants to do to build applications ultimately. Okay. But, you know, for some kind of some manual data analysis, what one does is one puts the network on a screen through a layout algorithm. Mm -hmm. And now there's lots of things that capabilities that you have. Uh, you, you're able to select parts of the network the way you would in Photoshop or Illustrator. And once I do that, I can make that into a set of data points because the nodes correspond to collections of data points. Okay. So now I have new sets that I can either perform other analysis on or I can ask for their explanation. That is to say, what is what are the features that characterize this subset? And mm -hmm. that's done in an appropriate mathematical and statistical sense. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some choices on that, but we made one particular choice. And what's, but what's that choice? And what the are choice the is uh, Komogoros. Well, the main thing is that we're deciding, we're, we're selecting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have distributions on the group of a particular variable on the groups, and the question okay. is to choose those variables which are maximally different in terms of the so-called Komogorov smirnov distance. On distributions. I'm just saying, I think there are other notions of distance on distributions one could use. Sorry, I, I, I won't sort of list those. But And so when you say you've made that choice, do you mean in a given use case you've selected one of many or the company's no. approach? The company's approach is that one. Got it. That's right. Okay. That's right. But it tends to do a good job of maximizing the distance for the class of problems that you're going after. It does. We find that, yes, we find that the explained capability is quite useful and works well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so that's something one can do with it. You can actually color by quantities of interest. So if I'm interested in things like revenue or survival or whatever it is, I can color a node by the average value of quantity for each of the data points. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes quite informative. And often what you see in the network is collections of hotspots, you know, where some, some value is high mm -hmm. and more than one place. And it turns out that they're different. They're high there for different reasons often. And that's what's quite but why the network is so informative. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you would just take any aggregate, you would study this quantity. And since you're 
then you know, putting together all the different ways in which that thing is, goes high, you, you, can't, you can't understand, you can't make sense of it in the way that you can when it's split out like that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that that's this kind of ad hoc interaction with the model is just one of mm -hmm. one way to, to interact with the model. But the way you describe that makes me think of use cases like forensic types of use cases like I associate with a company like Palantir. Do you overlap with, with them in the types of use cases you go after? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think the answer is we don't fully know the, in the interconnection. We know, I mean, what they're doing <laughs> is sort of searching data that comes as a network. Right. You know what I mean? Whereas in our case, we're saying, well, actually, all data can be represented as networks, mm -hmm. and, it, and it provides yeah. a compression. I actually think there are connections there between those things that could mm -hmm. make things efficient, but I wouldn't want to speak to them because I don't, you sure. know, I don't have firm ideas in mind. Do you tend to find yourself pursuing a lot of forensic types of use cases or you know at the moment we we've ha we have been focusing on you know healthcare and financial services okay. we are moving back into government in various ways and so okay. we may very well hit that okay yeah. so we talked about a little bit about this the ways that you can interact with this network that's created out of the data right. how else can you use these models so you know another thing that one could do is suppose that you have a linear regression or predictive model most likely, you know, it's, it's gotten by optimizing something, some kind of error function, mm -hmm. but it's probably not also not perfect. It's probably also the case that there are some areas within your data set, you know, some particular phenomena that happen that make that there are some systematic errors that happen. You know, you can't correct them within your own model and with the features that you've got, but what it allows us to do is it allows us to say, Let's take a network and let's color it by that model error. Maybe we find some hot spots for model error, and maybe I try to correct around those hot spots by adding features somehow. So that's another point. I mean, I would put it under the general heading of model diagnosis and model improvement. Mm -hmm. So that's another, uh, another situation. Interesting. You mentioned healthcare. What are some of the use cases in healthcare? So we have something called uh, clinical variation management, which okay. you know, helps study both finding new and optimizing care paths for particular you know, procedures, as well as tracking adherence to them. Okay. We have a population health kind of application that is working on trying to understand trends in population health. Who is going to go to the 5% group who are the most expensive? Who you know, is, getting, is on track to go bad and how can we improve their chances? Mm -hmm. That's a couple of things. There are some on the financial side as well. We, we work with hospitals as well as payers and the you know, you know, providers as well as payers mm -hmm. in the healthcare side. And can you maybe just to, to kind of tie the, all the terminology together, maybe pick one of those examples and walk us through you know, what the data tends to look like, mm -hmm. what the clusters might represent, what are some of the findings that someone might see? Yeah, so let's talk about the clinical variation management, for example. So, you know, the data there consists basically in all the events that happen during the course of someone's stay, say for some, for some particular surgical procedure, like right. knee replacement, like bowel surgery, and so forth. And so what one can then do is one needs to put on, you know, that set of things, some appropriate similarity measure, and that, you know, distance function, and that turns out to be, you know, quite a tricky, interesting problem. Mm -hmm. um, probably maybe the key part in, in, in solving that problem. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately it produces for us then sort of a consensus care path, maybe a few care paths that are, that are, that are very good, and one consensus uh, together with some explanations of what are the key features that, that differentiate it from others. Mm -hmm. So it's almost allowing you to identify, you know, which outcomes or, or which features of the care, if you will, mm -hmm. are kind of correlated with success and, you know, maybe where some outliers are. That's and right. And the, the features might be, you know, what drugs are, administ are administered, what doses they're administered, when they're administered, things like that. that. That's exactly right. And just to give you a sense of how it can work in, in one situation, when hospital systems are deciding on care paths, what they usually do is they get together sort of the people the smartest people that they can say who are working right. on, on, on this, and they get together in a room and they discuss it out and you know, ultimately come to some kind of answer about what it right. should be. There are a couple of problems with that model. You know, you may, maybe you haven't found all the best people who are doing this procedure. Maybe you haven't chosen exactly the right group. And anyway, it's also the case that when people are just sort of arguing things out in a room, sometimes you know, it's the 
strongest personality rather than the strongest right. case that comes out. So there's all sorts of issues with that. I also think there's like implicit versus explicit knowledge, right? I mean, there could just yeah. be things that, that some people do and they don't really realize that that's, that that's they're right. doing it different from the other doctors and so they don't know to argue it. Exactly. And then so in fact, that was, you know, what happened for us with one of our customers was, you know, exactly some of that. We found that for one surgical procedure, there was a group, a small group, kind of out in the periphery of the system that people hadn't really observed so much, but they were doing something that had good improved effect on length of stay. Okay. And so, you know, so that was found. And that was, you know, quite an important contribution to them. So even just in terms of kind of a search thing like that, yeah. it was quite, quite useful that way. Hmm. Interesting. So if someone wants to learn more about this, it sounds like mm-hmm. there's, it sounds like topology is... Uh, you know, an interesting place to start. Like, what is there a canonical paper or a reference uh, or something so let, like that? Let me warn you that, of course, if you go to study topology, you'll be involved for years before you get to <laughs> application. And so, so, so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, one could certainly read some things about it. But what I would say is, well, first of all, our company has a lot of stuff on, the web, on its website, basically, you can yeah. sort of a knowledge center. A lot of technical papers and somewhat less technical as well. So I would kind of recommend the reading survey paper route as opposed to, you know, taking a textbook and kind of chugging through yeah. it. Yeah. Because this is a newly developing subject. And so there are some textbooks in this persistent homology side that I talked about. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the general notion of topological modeling, you, you know, I think we have a lot of stuff uh, on our You're web page. creating it as you go along. On, but uh, yeah, actually, come to think of it, oh, here we do have... My colleague, FX Campion, Francis Campion, and I have written a book, which is called Machine Intelligence for Healthcare. Okay. And so oh, it's wow. available on Amazon, you know, and I recommend it. It's got the first half is kind of a discussion of this mathematical modeling. And then the second half is specifically how does this work in healthcare? Okay. So oh, that I sounds really interesting. That. Yeah. yeah. And did you elaborate on persistent homology or did we... You know, I think uh, we had... It, it's, let me just say that it is... It is a very interesting way of sort of detecting shape features, certain kinds of shape features in data. And as it is, you know, on the pure math side, it detects features in, you know, in regular spaces, spaces with complete information okay. and where you've got the whole, the whole thing. It can be used in two ways. The w- one way is it can be used as a way of recognizing what the overall organization of a data set is. You know, is it, we, we found, that, for example, in studying some image processing data sets that, you know, the frequently occurring phenomena in, in three by three patches are lined around, you know, one circumstance, a circle, in a slightly higher, you know, level of understanding around a mathematical object called the Klein bottle, which is, you know, very, was very interesting for us. We used it for understanding image compression and also okay. texture recognition. So that was, it was quite interesting. Second thing, though, is that it can be used, and this, I think, is going to be a much more rapid application is where it gets used to generate features in unstructured data. So when you have data that, that is complicated, but that somehow carries a notion of distance on it, like molecules, you know, where you, the atoms can be regarded as the points and the distance has to do with the bonds, mm-hmm. then you can attach so-called persistence barcodes to those points. And that's quite useful in, in organizing and understanding you know, those kind of unstructured databases, or databases of unstructured data. Hmm. Interesting. You mentioned earlier, and I saw it in the description of your session as well, something that I think is related to this, like identifying loops in data. What does that even mean, loops in data? Well, imagine, you know, I had a slide. Imagine that you have a picture, you you see your data. Suppose the data is actually in in 2D. Okay. And supposing that you've got a bunch of dots, so the data is a bunch of dots, and it looks like it's kind of surrounding, like it's a circle. We see it as a circle. Right, right. So something that like a machine? clustering algorithm doesn't really know how to deal with very well. Exactly. But you can identify this higher order primitive that, hey, this is a, yeah. like a geometrical primitive, essentially. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to mimic that fact. You know, we know what a loop looks like, but we don't know what it is our brain does to recognize that. And so, therefore, you do this homology. So ima- imagine that you're trying to understand how do you recognize a letter A from a letter B. Right. That letter A has two loops, sorry, a loop and two legs, and the B has two loops in it. Mm-hmm. So if you can find something that counts for you the number of loops 
you're going to be able to characterize letter A from a letter B. You'll be able to differentiate it. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to differentiate it in a way that's font independent, that's independent of the fact that you see it from, you know, one, from an angle perhaps, or that right. it's sitting on the surface of a soccer ball. It's kind of, it's miraculously kind of deformation. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not sensitive to those deformations. And that's what homology is. And so that sounds promising, but it also sounds... I guess I think about it in the context of deep learning, right? A deep learning purist would say, well, you know, it's going to be a lot easier to just throw tons and tons of data that have like all different kinds of B's, you know, and A's and just let the network teach it. And I've had this conversation with, with some folks that specialize in deep learning around combining other approaches to create higher level insights with the deep learning and you know, one of the answers is, ah, just throw the data at it and I let it figure true, it out. I think that's true, but of course, what you find is that, you know, there are adversarial approaches to that. Uh -huh. where, you know, so, you know, even for something as simple as MNIST, the MNIST data set, which is of hand-drawn numbers, where you find that if you just mess with the background a little bit, yeah. in a way that, you know, people wouldn't see the difference. People will see that, you know, a one is a one and a two is a two, but it messes up the deep learner. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. And that's a feature question. You see, it's, it's doing a certain kind of, well, overfitting is perhaps the wrong term, but it's focusing on some features that have to do with the background that are not really relevant. Right. And so to the extent that you can feed it features that are kind of background independent like that, mm -hmm. then you're in good shape. And that's what persistent homology is a perfect tool for providing features to a deep learner. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, it persistence, the output of the persistence thing can be regarded as an image, so it kind of fits directly into, mm -hmm. into that. So, yeah. Is this an application in, like, the, in theory, in, in principle, or are there de demonstrable situations using you know, MNIST or some other data set that says persistent homology outperforms deep learning or has some cost-benefit analysis relative well, remember, to... it's not outperforming deep learning. It is feeding into deep learning and using it. So the, the, the example I would point to... So is, we're, we're cre using the persistent homology to create features that either replace the raw images or augment yeah. the raw images, and then we're still using deep learning to learn. That's correct. Got it. That's correct. Now, again, most of this is sort of looking into the future. However, this exact thing has been carried out by, you know, a friend of mine or a colleague of mine at Michigan okay. State named Gu Wei Wei, who okay. has taken databases of molecules, you know, candidates for drugs, you know, or okay. kind of drug discovery, and built persistent homology barcodes on them, and then used those, used deep learning on those. Oh, wow. Extremely successfully. Okay. All right, I'll ask you afterwards for the spelling of that name so we can... Sure, uh, I'll write it down for you. Yeah. ...include it. That's right. Awesome. Well, it was great to, great to have you All right, here. Well, I learned a ton, and I feel like there's so much more to learn about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to learn. I feel that way every day. So, and, uh, you know, thanks very much. I enjoyed the conversation. Great. Thanks, Tony. All right, thank you. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and, of course, for your ongoing feedback and support. For more information on Gunner and any of the other topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 53. For the rest of this series, head over to twimlai.com slash AISF 2017. And please, please, please send us any questions or comments that you may have for us or our guests via Twitter at Twimmel AI or at Sam Charrington, or leave a comment on the show notes page. There are a ton of great conferences coming up through the end of the year to stay up to date on which events we'll be attending and hopefully to meet us there. Check out our new events page at twimmelai.com slash events, T W I M L A I.com slash events. Thanks again for listening and catch you next time.